Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Nick Dawson, Editor-in-Chief of Talk House Film. In the first couple of months of this year, the filmmaker Tiller Russell released not only the superb true crime doc series The Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer on Netflix, but also Silk Road, a real-life drama based on the dark web phenomenon of the same name and its shadowy founder, Russ Ulbricht. This one-two punch really got my attention, and when I discovered that Russell was a big TalkHouse fan, it wasn't long before he and I were making plans to find something fun to work on together. Today's episode of the podcast is the first in a planned series of conversation between Russell and other creators, and it's a cracker. The filmmaker Russell is talking to in this episode, Kevin Wilmot, is someone who, despite his illustrious career and considerable success, has somewhat flown beneath the radar. In 2019, he won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay for penning Spike Lee's Black Klansman, and also collaborated with Lee on both Chirac and one of the standout films of 2020, The Five Bloods. Wilmot is also a director in his own right, having helmed the string of films including CSA, The Confederate States of America, The Only Good Indian, and last year's The 24th, the story of the all-black 24th U.S. Infantry Regiment and the Houston riot of 1917. Russell and Wilmot had not had any contact before jumping on Zoom for a chat back in June, but it's awesome to hear just how quickly they click as they talk about each other's work, how it intersects, and a common thread that runs through Wilmot's movies the recurring theme of duality as defined so memorably by W.E.B. Du Bois. They also discuss balancing parallel projects, the unique catharsis that the movies give us, making work that resonates in a post-January 6th world, how Errol Morris changed Tiller's life, Kevin's path to becoming Spike Lee's chosen screenwriter, and much more. Just a quick heads up that there were some technical problems with the recording of this episode due to unstable Wi-Fi, one of the realities of work from home pandemic life, but the conversation is so great, a few glitches can't put a dent in it. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Taylor Russell and Kevin Wilmot. I'm a big fan of your work and wanted to talk to you about your process as both a writer as well as as a director. And kind of what had initially sparked my interest on it is your collaborations with Spike Lee obviously are, A, some of my favorite films, you know, period, and certainly in recent memory. But as I was sort of digging into it, I sat down and watched the 24th and was just absolutely blown away. And I was struck by a couple of particular things in watching, and I'm a longstanding fan from CSA Forward, right? But was sort of struck by a couple of things in watching the 24th. Let me just sort of pitch out to you some ideas that are in my head and get your thoughts on them. One is just kind of like the notion of duality and two-ness, which you had mentioned at a certain point in some interview, you know, referring specifically to Du Bois, and I'll read a, a quotation of his in a minute that specifically references it, but it even opened me up to thinking about it in even a much broader way as, you know, maybe potentially kind of a cornerstone of your work in some fundamental way, both as a writer, co-writer, and as a director. And so I wanted to kind of explore that you know, that notion and that concept with you a little bit and really on a couple of different levels, you know, which is the journey of making the 24th and the five bloods at the same time, you know, is a journey of duality. And those two films explore a similar set of themes, ideas, conceits, everything from, you know, their war movies, sort of, you know, know, or anti-war movies. <laughs> they're, they're, they're movies about being Black in America. They're movies about being Americans. They're, and, and there's just a lot of parallels in it. And I know as a filmmaker, I had a slightly a similar experience. I was making a couple of things simultaneously. I was doing a series for Amazon and a series for Netflix simultaneously. One was The Night Stalker for Netflix, and the other was The Last Narc about this notorious murder in Mexico. And it so happened that both of those films, both of those series, 
ended up being about murder in 1985, and with no intention that that would be the case or that they would be greenlit at the same time. But I'm kind of curious about your experience of, of the duality of making those two films, The Five Bloods and, and The 24th at the same time. I think The Five Bloods came a lot earlier, and they kind of came out at the same time, but they really weren't happening at the same time. In some ways. And I had started The 24th, yeah, I really had wrote it like 20 years ago. So Trey Byers, who plays Baltimore, you know, who plays Boston in the film, we rewrote it a few years ago and it became the script we used. But I'd been with that story for a long time. And so in that sense, it was very familiar to me. And, and directing it was something that you know I'd wanted to do for a very long time. But it was like an old friend. I knew the story really well. And even after Trey and I rewrote it, I still knew the story really well and kind of knew what I wanted and knew the approach completely and all of that. So it wasn't a challenge really to kind of, you know, I really wasn't working on them at the same time. But The Five Bloods obviously is a lot bigger film in the sense that it was shot in Thailand and Vietnam. And I was only there on the set for a few days. That was a, I always find ways of having a little, you know, autobiography in there a little bit. You know, I grew up in a little small town in Kansas called Junction City. And the Big Red One is adjacent to Junction City at Fort Riley. So I grew up seeing soldiers go to Vietnam as a kid and come back home. And I saw the Bloods and we called each other Bloods as kids. And I saw the damp handshakes and all of that stuff. And grew up with guys that their fathers had been to Vietnam so that was something very familiar to me. When Spike and I, that was a rewrite. We rewrote Danny Bilson and Aldo Mayo and really kind of rewrote it with them. I mean, they're great writers. So in that sense, it was it was not very outside of myself, either one of these projects, you know? So I was very fortunate in that way. And it sounds kind of like that's kind of your experience too when you were working on two projects at once. I mean, it didn't, I didn't feel like I was working on two at one time. We, we didn't start shooting the 24th until after the Five Bloods was shot, really. You know, the Five Bloods is such a bigger film that it took a long time to, I think, to put it all together. I was curious, you know, I had read that in early iterations of the script, I think Paul was the only black dude, it was all white dudes or so, some version right. of that. Right. It's so interesting, by the time a script actually makes it to the screen, all the yeah. different versions, like all the potential <laughs> versions, they're all gone and it could only ever be but that. You know? <laughs> That's what you're always hoping for, right? Yeah, definitely, man. And that thing that you were saying, when you find that moment and you write that moment and you finally get to see that moment, I mean, that was the... That, that reconciliation moment between Chadwick's character and Delroy's character, that's the movie. That's the whole point of the film. And because it pays off the five bloods, it pays off the that they had, it pays off what Storm and Norman meant to them and who he is and the power that he had in their lives. And it, and it pays off, and you understand now why Paul's such a crazy stuff dude. So it's all it all comes together like that. But you're so right, man. I mean, that thing that you're talking about, you know, I, I talk to guys, you talk to students and other filmmakers about it. And I think sometimes people don't understand that thing you're getting at about finding those moments, because that's the thing that takes a movie, I think, to the next level. Well, and it's also a thing that, in a way, only the movies can do, right? I mean, the truth That's of the right. matter is we don't get That's to right. live like that. We Oftentimes, right. you know, you don't have that catharsis. You don't have all of those things coming together and being that clear and crystallized and universally accessible. And that's the, like, that's the power of the movies, you know what I mean, at their finest. Like, that's why we go to the movies. No doubt about it, man. And it's a thing that movies can do that real life doesn't really get. You know, so much in life, in real life, you know things, you feel things, but you don't get to have those moments where you get Chadwick and Delroy and they get to finally have it out and they get to forgive each other. And especially something that's violent, and especially with something that is life altering. That's the thing that movies can do that really kind of teaches you about what life's all about in a sense, really. Yeah, but I mean, about being human, you know? I mean, that's great art, right? It's like, that's how we make sense of who we are in a fundamental way. I'm curious about, you know, going back to the duality idea for a minute. Yeah, that thing that you were saying about the, uh, in the 24th, and, and it's also in Black Klansman as well. That's a big kind of 
up to my work. And it's fun that that Du Bois quote, you know, is a big, I think it defines all of us, really. I mean, obviously it defines black folks, but I think what's happening in the country right now in January 6th, I think it's that duality of being an American. And I think a lot of people are being torn in weird different ways now about how they feel about what they're part of. And with black folks, it's always been being black and being an American. And you would think that that's not a complex thing, but it ends up being a really complex thing. And black folks, the whole love, love, love America. I mean, I think we may love America more than anybody. I mean, how could you not, after we've kind of invested as, as deeply as we have in the country, with very little return in so many ways? And so that whole thing of being black and being American, that's a struggle that we've had to find a way to live with for a very long time. And Du Bois writes that at the turn of the century when the 24th is literally happening at that time. But that struggle of being both black and being an American it gets more complex all the time. I mentioned January 6th stuff. I mean, that's democracies being challenged and being threatened. And people are afraid of what's going to happen, going in the direction that it's going. And I think Black folks see what's going on and it's like, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's the America we live in all the time, you know? They have baked into America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Welcome to the club. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> you know? So it's really interesting in that sense that I hope that well, for one, one thing, I hope we survived this. You know, because I think there's real questions of, of whether what we can we'll pull out of this. And I think what the 24th says and what Five Bloods and, and Black Klansmen, all those movies, that duality we're talking about, you know, it's like the duality of Flip's character in, in Black Klansmen. Yep. And he's black, he's he's Jewish, and he's he's an American. He's Jewish and he's white. He's Jewish and he's a cop. And he's got all these different levels of duality. He's also dealing with, especially being around these these clans. He's clans That's exactly right. semitic all day long, right? So he's seeks and he's kind of put his Jewish self way over there to the side somewhere, and he kind of disconnected it from himself. And now he can't because these Nazi guys are just in a state all day long, crap. And so he has to come to terms with that. And so folks have never get really put it away, we try, but because you can see, you can- You're allowed to, it's not a fun You're, not, you're not allowed, you're not allowed to, you can't, you can't, you can't hide from it. And so that, that's that, that's that thing, that duality you're talking about, that it takes on so many different levels and, and the, the, the it's, it's the duality of being black and, and being, a, uh, being blue, being, being black and being an American, being Jewish and being an American, so many levels of it all the time in the film. And and then, you know, and then you've Ron Stallman pretending to be a, a, a glazer <laughs> on, on, top, on top of that. So so everybody's pretending to be somebody else, really, uh, on a different level. Well, and in a way, like your work is, I think, kind of consistently exploring that. You know, the 24th is the same thing where it's like, right. okay, are you black enough? Are you too educated? Are you a soldier? Are you an officer? All these levels of dualistic thinking, right? Which is antagonism. Like, you know, at the end of the day, why people reach toward spirituality or God or whatever it is, is to escape the like conflict of duality. You can only be either or and therefore in conflict. That's right. That's right. And I think the, the black experience is that thing we're talking about where you can't escape the duality. I mean, we, we'd like to. I mean, you know, I think black folks tend to be very thing you're talking about because that's kind of always been a, a source of escape for us, you know, but you can't escape completely because there's no complete escape from this. And that duality defines our experience in this country. And definitely, I mean, I, I have another film called The Only Good Indian, where Wes Studi's character in that film is going through the same thing. Yeah, I never really realized that I was writing about something about that just the other day. And it really struck me. It's like, I, 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 I never get away from this damn thing. You know, it's, and maybe that's okay. I don't know. What do you I think that's what great artists do is kind of consistently explore the heart, you know, different sort of facets of the same 
jewel, you know? And I guess, you know, for the purpose of, if you don't mind, I'd love, you know, it, you made me, when I re- ran across your mention of it, it made me go back and, and pull up the line. So I'd love to just read a little, you know, the passage in question so that people are sure. you know, hip to what we're talking about. So this is from the Atlantic in August, 1897, written by Du Bois. And it says, the Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. And I'll just one additional passage of this that I'd like to share, which is, it continues, the history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. And in this meaning, he wishes neither of the older selves to be lost. He simply wishes to make it possible for a man to be both a Negro and an American without being cursed and spit upon by his fellows, without losing the opportunity of self-development. This is the end of his striving, to be a co-worker in the kingdom of culture, to escape both death and isolation, and to husband and use his best powers. Yeah, man, that's such, uh, thanks for reading that, man. That, that, you know, Du Bois, he defined the whole century, and we now into a new century, and he's still defining it, I think. Certainly things have improved, and things have gotten better, but look at somebody even like Obama. I mean, the two-ness of him. You get to be the president of the United States, the, the biggest, and you do this thing out, you know? Yep. And it requires code switching, right? You got to be code switching. You got to be code switching all the time. It just never goes away. And the thing you were talking about with your films, too, you know, it's like with Tunis and this duality, when it becomes corrupted and when it becomes damaged to the point where it messes up the psyche, that's where you get killers. That's where violence often comes from. That's where where people can't reconcile. You can't reconcile. Yeah. They can't reconcile it, man. They can't figure a medium out there where you can balance it out. Because it's it's hard to balance it when everything is going well. Right. You know On what I mean? The best of it, days in perfect circumstances. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. But when things go really bad, like, you know, you've got abuse in your family and you've got you've got, you know, the things that create killers. Then, the moment then, you snap in a riot. It's the same, like the moment you snap, you know? The moment you snap. And the guys that typically snap are the guys that don't have that thing that Du Bois is talking about that have found a way to balance and control and navigate this very complex thing of being this this, this tunis that you can imagine in the racist days that he was in, that you know, people are people are attacked directly in their face all the time. You had to control yourself on such a deep and profound level all the time. But I think more than anything, it ends up being family. And it ends up being, if you've got abuse in your family, if you've got problems at home, if you if the mama daddy thing is not working right, then you've got you've got people that turn into folks that, that you deal with in some of your films that you're dealing with killers. Yep. Talk about how that happens in your films. I mean, you've dealt with some profound mass murders. And it's weird because I'm not quite like the stories have magnetized to me in some way or another. They're not stories that I went out seeking and sort of more and more making these films now. It's kind of like their incoming calls. And it is, I think it is often about and I think a lot of just, I guess, the violence in culture at whatever level is like not being able to it's stuck in this like tribal mentality you know what i mean where it's us and them and at a certain point fuck it i'm gonna kill you because i want my thing or mine is more valuable and you're devalued in whatever way and it's those people or and i guess maybe it is to some extent in anyone or in the human psyche you know jung would say 
that shadow side is in all of us, right? That darkness and the ability to go over. But most of us, you know, we we go see a dark movie or we go experience a documentary where somebody does something and it in some way you're able to separate from it versus those people that irrevocably cross the threshold. And it's like, well, man, the, you know, and when you sit in the, you know, in the room and look into the eyes of somebody that is like a trigger puller, it is people who are different in kind from those of us who don't do that, you know? Yeah. And that shadow you're talking about, that young thing of that other self, you know, that you're trying to keep in check. I mean, I've been around a lot of, you know, guys that end up doing bad things, you know, and it's interesting when, when they, they're not like, you know, I stalker or somebody like that, that, that they're not to that extreme, but it comes from the same place. Doesn't it does. It? And they talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's like, you know, it's, you know, Mick Jagger sung about it in the Rolling Stones song, you know, it's just a shot away. It's it's that notion that that we have, I think, as human beings, we have all of the complexities, you know, we can be completely in love, we can be riven with hate, we can, you know, the potentialities are in all human beings. And oftentimes, what we as filmmakers or storytellers or writers end up doing is, it's the sort of most extreme versions of these, right? But for what happens in Houston, you know, that becomes the stuff of art. And I think you are culturally digesting that violence for us in that film by now running it back through your imagination and these artistic collaborators. And in some way or another, you know, I feel like it can be the same thing or hopefully it is the same thing where it's not a gratuitous exploration of like, I don't give a shit about Richard Ramirez or, and like the last thing I ever want to do is glorify or or shed a light on somebody that was hungry for publicity. But I think as human beings, how we make meaning is through story and it's, and it's by telling and retelling this stuff that we culturally process it. Yeah. I mean, and it's important to go to those places that we don't understand. I say not to glorify it, but to understand it. And explore it, explore it. Because it is part of the terrain of the human psyche and the human experience. No doubt about it. And I think we're all curious about it. Because we, you know, especially now, it's like every day something's on the news, somebody's done some the next horrible thing, and we have a hard time reconciling it, you know. I mean, I heard this guy just on TV just yesterday so there's a, like a 14 year old and a 12 year old that was shooting at cops and these cops and they had like an AK-47 and and these cops were like, they, they were like, hey, I can't believe it. they're shooting at us and trying to kill us. And they were just so just kind of blown away by these young people being willing to do that. And I think guys like us that go there in those spaces, I, but I was kind of like, really, you, you really, you're really shocked about that? I mean, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, it's amazing. It doesn't happen a lot more often, really, right? You know, it's like when you've got all these damaged folks, kids, especially, especially now, and they're going through all these things. And then you say, hey, by the way. And there's an AK-47 in the back room. Yeah, you you're, get your you're fully on. armed. It's locked and loaded. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and so it's like, at least with the, with the Ramirez guys of the world, that's a like an individual weird kind of sickness thing, as opposed you know, to cultural. Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 You know, this that's something that happened to him specifically and made him all messed up. And then he took it out on us. That's right. But what those two kids were doing, that's that's kind of a different thing. It's the failure of the culture in a fundamental sense. It's the failure of the culture, man. And where we're at is like, I wonder, or it makes you wonder, are we at a like breaking point? And I think on the one hand, people have been saying this forever, right? It's been the end of the world since there's been a world. We've been right on the verge of it. But on the (laughs) other, you know, it does feel pretty, pretty desperate and pretty, um, you know, it's it's a powder keg world, man. Well, you know, America's got to figure some stuff out. And, you know, we're the leader of the world and we're the last guy on the block, too, at the same time, at the same time, you know, it's it's the very thing, though, that that you were talking about. Those those cops with with those two young people I just talked about, they ended up saying that they blamed that video game 
the race car video game, um, you know, right. Whichever one call of duty or whatever the hell it was, you know, yeah. They, they blame that for why these kids were messed up and, and you're going like, no. And, 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 you know, they said the same thing with, with the like satanic panic and Richard Ramirez in the eighties, it was like, Oh, it's heavy metal or like, Oh, it's gangster rap in the nineties. Yeah. It's like, yeah. come on, man, that like, this is evocations and, and people painting the world as they see it, not necessarily influencing, you know, the way people are. I have two questions for you, though, which I came into this, you know, really wanting to know, which is, and I guess it, it is kind of on the duality tip, too, of, of both being and becoming. But, you know, the journey for you of, you know, being Spike Lee's collaborator on these last three amazing films, directing your own stuff at the same time. I think everybody wonders, man, how the hell, like, how the hell do I become Kevin Wilmot? Like, what's the journey? You know, like, <laughs> it, you know, for anybody that, that loves this and aspires to it, how do you go from being a young man that's, you know, like, damn, Spike's making some cool shit. And that makes me want to go make movies to being a partner and collaborator and like in the trenches drafting a script with him. Yeah, you know, I tell you, Tiller, man, you know, if if I'd out to try to do it, it would have never happened, probably, <laughs> you know, the deal. You know, and I hear you, how it happened, too, because everybody's got a story, man, and, and everybody's story is a little different. For me, you know, I, you know, I love movies as a kid. Um, went to the movie all the time in the neighborhood, the whole neighborhood, all the guys' neighborhood. And we didn't go to Disney movies. We went to grown folks movies. We didn't go. We were too good for that Disney stuff. Yeah, man. We went went to Westerns, man. Good and Bad and Ugly was a huge, was a huge, I think I saw that in like third grade or something. And it was like totally blown away. James Bond, all that stuff. And then the black exploitation movies in the 70s were were a big, huge thing. And Gordon Parks was a big influence on me. Gordon Parks is a Kansan too. And so... You know, very, very, very inspirational in that sense. But for me, it was also act And movies, for me, always taught me things. It made me understand life a little better. It's like the thing that you're talking about when you explore a killer. And if you do it right, you understand not, you know, it's... it's Exploring a killer is not really about the crime. It's about understanding human existence a little more when you're done. And that's kind of what's great about movies that, you know, in the end, you kind of understand. And that's how movies affected me as a kid, really, was that uh, it made me, it taught me things about being black and it taught me how to kind of be a better person and and to how to live in the country and how to reconcile this thing we've been talking about, this tunis thing in, mm-hmm. in many ways. So for me, it kind of, I just wanted to tell the stories that I really cared about. And so the movies I've made on my own, I made, I've made a lot of small movies on my own. And making those movies, I think, allowed me to really define what I care about and what my thought is and what I want to share with the world right. in a way. It's clarifying. And yeah, yeah. It kind of def- ends up defining you. So when I finally kind of met, I was already kind of you know, our things just kind of reconciled. It just kind of... Your roads converged, right? You were both... Where our roads converged. Right? Yeah. And we have a very different experience. You know, I'm in Kansas. He's in Brooklyn. You know, it's very... Two very different experiences, but at the same time, very similar experiences. And we care about the same things. You know, but tell me about yours, man. You know, I mean, it's it's the same thing. I was a kid growing up in Dallas, Texas with no connections to anybody. How am I ever going to make a movie? And I was like working in a video store. It was like close to <laughs> And I loved it. I loved being in the video store, you know. Oh, yeah, man. Oh, yeah. And then eventually, you know, I ended up becoming like a crime reporter writing for the newspaper, you know, just because I was kind of comfortable knocking around with cops and crooks and whatever. And what ended up happening was, you know, weirdly... I suddenly I realized I had a press pass. I was like, shit, I can go like meet all the movie people, you know? And so I, I went and sat down with, uh, Errol Morris was, was, uh, was promoting it oh, yeah. at the time. And sure. I got the last interview of the day with him. He was like, man, I'm so sick of these interviews. You want to go get a steak and a bottle of wine? And I was just thinking like nothing on earth. I want to do more, man. <laughs> and we went and, uh, and, and went to, you wow. know, went to this hotel and, and got a steak and a bottle of wine. And at the end of it, he reached up and put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, you're either going to spend the rest of your life writing about people like me, or you're going to try your hand at this. And I literally called the newspaper the next day and I was like, I quit. Like, uh, this is what I'm doing. And it took a long time, but that was. Sure, it always does, man. 
you know, like yeah. that it was like, okay, that's, that's where my world is bending off in that way. You know, that's beautiful. Man. That's beautiful. And, and, and it'd be beautiful for him to put his hand on you, man, you know, cause you, you kind of, you need somebody to kind of say, you, you need to go on and do that thing you've been talking about, you know, and it helps when you get, so especially somebody like that to say, yeah, go, go do the, go do that thing, man. What did you kind of learn from exploring crime and stuff? I mean, before you started making movies about it, what was the thing that really stuck with you? And, and I think there's two things and it touches on, you know, these two of your latest films as well is in a way Crime, I think, is kind of it's the closest we get to war in a civilian society. Yeah. Like the stakes are life yeah. and death, man. And whether you're yeah. a gangster walking out the door with, you know, strapped or whether you're a cop, you know, undercover cop walking out the door, like every time you go to work, you can get killed. And so yeah. there is a there's a level of drama in that and sort of intensity that I think I was. I wanted the passport to experience it secondhand without having to get right. shot myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I love about, you know, the nonfiction work, you know, and kind of going back and forth between the two is it's a passport to other lives and other worlds that you would never otherwise get to experience, but for wading into it with the camera, you know? Yeah. It's so interesting because being a policeman and writing about, you know, or being a detective or, you know, somehow being in the world of crime, you obviously you experience all these difficult, horrible, inspiring ways and things. But when you're outside of it, like you are, and you're looking at it, you got to know the difference. Man. Yeah, that's right. You know, what I mean, it's like when I was a kid, I was going, well, no, I wouldn't mind being a cop because it's it seemed exciting, you know. But it's like I don't I didn't really want to be a cop. I want to I want to write about exciting things, you know. That's what you're talking about, man. It's being you a chronicler. Wanna, right? You don't have to be. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a funny path, you know, because in a way, you, it's not firsthand, but you have to get as close as the truth to as you, you know, to paint the world for people so that they understand, like, this is what it feels like, you know. This is as close as I can get you into those shoes. What's been one of the things that, you know, especially dealing with a guy like Ramirez, what's the thing that kind of that you learn the most from exploring someone with a, that's done something like that? I mean, there's a bunch of things, but what's some of the things that have stayed with you? You know, the, the weird thing and, and not to be sort of excessively spiritual about it, but what I have found with it is. Whenever people are going that deep into the darkness, there's somebody yeah. else nearby that is going that far into the light, you know, and like whether it be the cops that are investigating a horrible murder or a horrible killer or whatever, it becomes it's more than a job, man. It's a calling. And it's like they they are going into that darkness so that we don't have to. And bringing something back out to the light so that we retain our humanity as a culture or as a people or as whatever. And so yeah. I think it, it does kind of go back to that duality thing where it's like, wherever there is that degree of darkness, there is an equal force of light somewhere in there. That's a beautiful way of looking at it, man. And cops get such a, a bad rap these days, you know, there's deservingly so, but we, I think we all know that, you know, a lot of great cops out there and cops have a tough job, especially when it comes to the kind of stories that you tell, you know, about horrible crimes, how do you think they deal with going home after having to look in the world of all that stuff? You know, it's 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 amazing. And, and of all the ones that I know that do it and kind of, you know, everybody deals with it differently, I guess. You know, some people can just go home and like what they call like turn out the lights, man. And it's like, OK, yeah. I'm with my wife and yeah. kids. We're going to the ball game, whatever. And I think but then I think, you know these stories, the what, why we end up telling these stories, you know, as filmmakers is because they have irrevocably changed all these people's lives. And those people are still processing them, whether it's, you know, the Black Klansman story or like anybody right. involved in that is still or what happened in Houston or, right. you know, what happened in Vietnam. Like 
we are still like reckoning with the baggage of all that, you know, the violence and the pain and the power and the conflict. It's weird because, you know, like Houston this weekend, I was in uh, Tulsa, you know, dealing you know, with for the whole memorial of, of that uh, whole event. And, you know, it's funny because you would think that our two worlds of of our movies are very different, but they're really kind of the same, you know, in, in a weird way, you know? And how do you think when you experience something as horrible as we, in Kansas, it was it was a BTK killer. You know, we had, you know, that's the guy that we grew up with and, and he scared the hell out of us as kids, you know? So these kind of like notorious crimes that end up kind of affecting the nation really. And then you have these kind of racial crimes that end up affecting the nation. How do we kind of deal with the memory of that? They seem like very different memories, but are they? But I think they're con- the memories are connected in some weird way. No, I, I think I think it's a it's a brilliant point, and I think that they are profoundly connected. And I recently read. Um, I just happened to have read Jill Lepore's book, um, These Truths. You know, the kind of her retelling of American history and like reading that stuff in the, you know, reading that book in the Trump era. And, right. you know, it was like, wow. man, all this shit has been baked into America from inception, from polarized yeah. press yeah. to the sort of racial oh, yeah. divisions, to the tendency to violence, to, you know, it's really like, and, and in a weird way, we as a culture and as a country have memorialized this stuff, right? It's like the, you know, from, I don't know, Billy the Kid through the Godfather, America is the story of crime, you know, Mm. and we lionize that stuff. And it's also the story of our violence and tragedies from, you know, Tulsa to, you know, the the 60s to, you know, now, right? What what, what we're dealing with, like that, it's a weird, consistent piece of America, you know? Yeah. And, you know, and don't you feel, man, that after January 6th and not just the political thing of it, but the, the Trump part of it and the lying and the, the, the evilness of all of that stuff that kind of was woven into that that whole four years that we were had with that that thing that something really bad is getting ready to happen. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but. I mean, I've been feeling like, you know, I had a a cousin who lived next door to the federal building in Oklahoma City. And he said he it, when the explosion happened, he was thrown out of his bed. He walked outside and there were bodies all up in the trees. man. And I think that this whole weird kind of brew that that's being stirred right now in this country. You know, with the voting stuff and and all this weird kind of mixture of the QAnon thing and all this crazy stuff that's happening, that something really bad is going to is getting ready to happen. I mean, I mean, you, know, you know, I know we're just we're talking about we're talking about art, but in a way, art comes out of our feelings. You know what I mean? And and you can't that. You can't look at what's happening and not see like, man, this is some this, this is a bad, this is a bad, weird, and maybe something great will come out of it. But it's I think it kind of goes back to that duality again. Either something really great is gonna happen or something really bad, or, or a little bit of both, something something. What do you think? It's well, it's a loaded, powerful moment, I think. And no matter what happens, you know, whether it sort of pops and boils over or whether we're able to kind of keep it in and transform it or turn the ship, I think like January 6th is something that artists are going to be reckoning with and the past yeah. four years or something that artists are going to be reckoning with for a long time. Like, cause we yeah. have not, we haven't digested any of the stuff that we've been through. And in a way, no. you know what? That's our job, and that's the next generation. That's job. job is to that's right, man. figure out that's how right. to, you know, br- you know, hopefully digest it and bring it to the light. And you know that there's some dudes out there now in their basement that have have drank all this stuff in and, and are and have got and has messed their heads up, and they're thinking about bad things and in the form of a Ramirez or a BTK. And then there's that that same thing is happening you know, socially and, you know, politically and and in terms of just the overall effect on a nation, you know, and it's this weird combination of 
of, 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 you know, you got me going with this thing <laughs> of the serial killer and the nation, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's this weird, just, I mean, a QAnon thing, that's some, that's some crazy stuff, man. And I think, you know, in the interest of kind of like wrapping it together for everybody, you know, I think in a weird way, that's one of the biggest challenges that we face right now is we're in this kind of like post-truth disinformation world yeah. where it's like, man, anybody can believe anything. Nobody knows, you know, and we've kind of like yeah. lost our moorings. And I think like what we need to bend back to, and I think art is a piece of this, is like right. you know what you can depend right. on is like real human beings and like your films being about what it means to be a man in America, what it means to be like a black man in America. And I guess I'll sort of close with this, but like both of those movies to me, like it's a beautiful thing that you're sending into the world is that's a message of hope about manhood and how to be a good man in an impossible world. And I think like it's artists like you making work like those films that is the torch of hope in dark times. Amen, brother. Amen. You know, I mean, that's that's all we can do, man. We just got to try to kind of keep on trying to these stories that uh, somehow we, um, you know, can make it a, a little better, a little clearer way, my brother. I so enjoyed the time with you, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hey, no doubt, man. Thank you so much to Taylor Russell and Kevin Wilmot for being on the TalkCast podcast. And thanks to you for listening. This episode was produced by Melissa Kaplan and the TalkCast podcast theme music, as ever, was composed and performed by The Range. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit talkcast.com slash film and subscribe to the TalkCast podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts and go dig into our archive. I'm Nick Dawson, and until next time, Take it easy and stay safe.